Welcome everyone to the webinar on ecosystem-based adaptation and climate risk finance and insurance. My name is Andrea Bender. I hope you can hear me well. And I'm working for the BMU EK funded global project on mainstreaming EBA implemented by GIZ. We organized the series of webinars for the international EBA community of practice where people working on ecosystem-based adaptation can exchange their experiences and learn from each other. And we also compile different studies on EBA. And today we are very delighted to welcome also colleagues from the Into Resilience Global Partnership, as well as experts from the University of Santa Cruz, the Nature Conservancy and Social Impact Partners. But before we dive into the topic, I would like to give you some technical remarks first. So you are all muted as participants, unfortunately. This is to keep the connection stable, but please feel free to actively join the webinar by using the chat box function on your left-hand side. You can raise your questions and comments there as well. We'll also share some links. And the webinar will be recorded and published on Adaptation Community Net afterwards. So if you're facing troubles also with a Skype connection or if you would not like to be recorded th through this chat box function, you can watch the webinar afterwards online on Adaptation Community Net. And if you're facing technical problems, um, please send your email address to matthias.bertram at giz.de. So he will try to help you further. And um, yeah, to start, um, I would like to briefly present you all speakers today. A very warm welcome to you, Michael Beck. Um, since 2016, you are a research professor at the Institute of Marine Sciences, University of California, Santa Cruz. Before, Mike worked at the Nature Conservancy, helping to establish a global marine program and then serving as a lead marine scientist. Mike works on marine conservation with a focus on coastal resilience across science, businesses, and policy to bring clear tools and results to decision makers. Then we also um, welcome Oliver Quast. He has been working with Munich Reinsurance since 2008 as an underwriter and global business development manager with a focus on risk and risk transfer solutions since November 2018. Oliver is the director of financial solutions at Social Impact Partners in Munich. And a very warm welcome also to you, Kerstin Fliegner. Um, she's the Germany director of the Nature Conservancy and leads the climate risk and resilience program of TNC's Europe region. She has joined TNC three years ago and works closely both with science and insurance industry partners on integrating EVA solutions with climate risk transfer. And prior to that, um, Kerstin, you have worked as a climate and ecosystem-based adaptation expert, both for the German Ministry of Environment and in many years also in East Africa for UNDP. And uh, last but not least, I would like to welcome you, Daniel. Daniel Stadtmüller works as an advisor at the Secretariat of the Institute Resilience Global Partnership, which is hosted by GIZ. And within that role, he coordinates the program alliance, the partnerships alliance of operating programs. And prior to this, he also worked at Munich Re in the area of parametric insurance and insurance linked capital market solutions. So um, the reason why we commissioned this study jointly together with a global project on mainstreaming EBA, ACRI Plus, and the Insure Resilience Secretariat was that we realized there's a lot of interest in combined adaptation approaches such as clim climate risk insurance and nature-based solutions. So Daniel, maybe you would like to elaborate a bit further on that. So we well, welcome to you and please unmute your microphone to briefly introduce us to the Insure Resilience Global Partnership and the reasons why we collaborated on that study. Thank you so much, Andrea, and hello, a very warm, warm welcome to everyone on the line. Um, yes, so I'm, I'm really thrilled to introduce this uh, piece of work and uh, also to give a little bit of background on why we um, supported this and uh, where this is coming from within the Insure Resilience Global Partnership. For those of you that are not familiar with the partnership, it's a, a global platform for um, collaboration shared learnings and the delivery of climate and disaster risk finance and insurance solutions. So uh, the idea is to bring together developing countries, um, G20 countries, development partners, the private sector, international organizations and civil society. And currently there are uh, 25 programs active in over 75 countries and a total of 75 member organizations signed up to the partnership. Um, one of the, let's say, main um, 
areas of work of the partnership or one of the um, mechanisms that we have is that we work in working groups and um, to focus on specific topics that are of uh, strategic interest for the partnership and its member base. Um, one uh, demand driven topic was uh, the area of integrated approaches. Um, the reason being that um, the partnership has always emphasized to embed climate and disaster risk finance and insurance in a comprehensive risk management framework. Um, mainly because uh, we realize there are various uh, interrelations, uh, interfaces, um, and shared benefits across different risk management components. And um, risk finance and insurance can deliver benefits beyond just financial protection. It can incentivize risk reduction. It can also be used in an ex ante preparedness phase. Um, and it can uh, work towards a resilient recovery as well. Um, so the idea is, uh, the idea of the working group was to um, explore approaches, bundled solutions where um, risk finance and insurance elements are combined with elements of risk reduction, with uh, measures of preparedness um, to help capture these shared benefits and to um, overcome also either or trade-offs between investing in risk reduction, for example, or investing in risk transfer. And within that, um, within that working group, one area that we started looking into very early already was nature-based solutions. So um, how can um, nature be used as a resilience barrier? How can nature be used to improve the resilience of poor and vulnerable people? Um, and how can we combine nature with insurance in ways that um, nature provides benefits for the insurance product and vice versa? Um, so. With that, I think um, I would like to hand over to the three authors of the study um, to provide um, findings. And um, I'm happy then to talk about a little bit more on the next steps that we are envisioning for this part uh, for this from this study afterwards. Thank you. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, this is Mike Beck from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, uh, guten Tag, guten Morgen. Uh, I, I just checked uh, the German weather, and I'd like to invite you all here to California for a warm cup of coffee and some sunshine this morning. Um, so uh, with that, uh, uh, Daniel's given a great uh, introduction uh, to the project. Uh, it really is uh, important as risks are rising uh, and there's great interest in finding solutions, uh, but where do we find uh, those uh, potential joint opportunities uh, between insurance and ecosystem-based adaptation? And there's a small uh, but growing number of examples around that. Um, uh, most are coastal, but we looked uh, well beyond that uh, as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as a, a group of authors, uh, we bring a variety of expertise across academia, uh, uh, NGOs, and uh, risk management. Uh, so uh, we really uh, uh, formed a team, uh, did all aspects uh, of the work. I'm going to cover the science uh, today. Uh, Kirsten's going to cover uh, some of the case studies. Uh, and then uh, Oliver is going to talk about uh, some of the findings and recommendations. Uh, and we'll uh, all be able uh, to uh, answer some of the questions uh, at the end. Next slide. So uh, ultimately in all of this, what we're trying to do is see if there are opportunities for we'll call shorthand insurance, but we really mean climate risk financing and insurance, which is the ability of the industry to support people to adapt to the adverse effects of climate change. Next. And to see where that uh, overlaps uh, with with ecosystem-based adaptation, uh, and this is just the the, the common definition uh, for EBA, uh, the use of biodiversity and its ecosystem services as part of an overall adaptation strategy to help people um, uh, adapt to the effects of climate change. Next slide. All right, uh, science is at the, at the core of finding these opportunities, in part because basically it can be shown that 
once you can rigorously quantify the adaptation benefits from ecosystems, then you open up a wide range of opportunities for financing the conservation and the restoration of those ecosystems for the benefits of people. Um, uh, some of the, the best and most detailed work on this quantification is done in coastal ecosystems. Uh, back in 2016, uh, the World Bank reviewed uh, what was known about the role of reefs and mangroves uh, for their adaptation benefits and uh, indicated that we could rigorously quantify those benefits using the same sort of approaches uh, that are employed by the wider engineering and insurance community. I'm not going to go through all of the, the, the phases in depth here, but basically um, there's a series of models, five stages, um, uh, where you need to understand how um, uh, waves and flooding move offshore, onto shore, over habitat, um, uh, and what the flooding looks like across the entire storm frequency distribution, your one in 10 year, one in 100 year storm, uh, and then you estimate the damages uh, to people and property. Uh, here there are two flood lines on the uh, lower right, uh, the solid line, 10 year flood with habitat, uh, and then the dash line, uh, 10 year flooding uh, without habitat, uh, so that's the new New flooding that would happen if you had lost the habitats there in stage three. And basically, all of the people and property between those two lines represent the people and property receiving benefits from keeping those habitats in place, or conversely, if you were restoring them, the adaptation benefits uh, provided by them. Okay, next slide. That uh, approach has then been applied globally to coral reefs around the world. Uh, a paper published last year shows the annual expected benefits provided by reefs in terms of avoided flood damage. So that really gives an idea uh, that you can identify the hot spots where reefs are providing the greatest flood reduction benefits. You can do that uh, either economically or socially. Next slide. And uh, the same has recently been uh, published for mangroves uh, as well. So in this graphic, uh, the height of the bar indicates uh, the flood reduction benefits provided by mangroves. Again, uh, this is a, a good indication of the monetary, the economic value <clears throat> uh, of these habitats uh, for adaptation. Next slide. This, uh, this is also work <clears throat> that the insurance industry uh, is engaged in. Uh, so uh, uh, both uh, Lloyds of London and Risk Management Solutions, RMS, uh, uh, examined uh, with the Nature Conservancy uh, and others uh, the role of marshes during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and what they found within these industry standard models uh, was that um, marshes reduced damages in the Northeast US by some $625 million. Uh, and that represents, on average, a 15% annual expected benefit uh, provided by these marshes. That 15% is in the order of which uh, insurers would consider premium incentives uh, for these adaptation or, or flood risk reduction benefits uh, from these habitats. Next slide. And just last week, uh, these sorts of analyses for wetlands were repeated for the mangroves in Florida during Hurricane Irma. Uh, some of you may remember that uh, two years ago, 2017, uh, was the most expensive hurricane season on record. Uh, uh, Irma was one of those. The mangroves in Florida uh, were even more valuable than the marshes in the in the Northeast U.S. Um, uh, 
uh, helping to avoid $1.5 billion in flooding damages uh, during uh, Irma, and that represents a 25% annual expected benefit. So again, these are the kinds of real benefits that you can then consider uh, within the realm uh, of financial tools, uh, particularly associated with insurance, for addressing uh, conservation and adaptation needs. Next slide. And then uh, my, my final slide to, to note here is that uh, this kind of work uh, can now be done uh, at very high resolution. Uh, these were uh, some uh, from a report uh, released in May by the U.S. Geological Survey that examined uh, flood risk reduction benefits of U.S. coral reefs, uh, all 3,000 kilometers uh, of those reefs, examined flooding ultimately, and if you kind of can see on the map on the left, um, uh, flooding down to lower than a block by block level, actually down to 10 by 10 meters, examining flooding with in tan and then without reefs in red um, to really know very specifically the places, the communities, the municipalities uh, receiving uh, those benefits uh, from reefs. Uh, so really these days uh, uh, in some aspects, and there's somewhat similar science going on in freshwater ecosystems, uh, a little less so uh, in forested ecosystems, although uh, there is a good bit of work uh, to understand uh, the values uh, of uh, habitats and watersheds for improving uh, water quality and quantity. Uh, so that's also uh, a very important area where uh, these adaptation benefits uh, have been uh, rigorously quantified. Next slide. Okay, and with that, I pass to my colleague, Kristen. Thank you, Mike. So I will present to you now um, our, our method that we used for this study. We used a comparative analysis method based on case studies. And um, Mike and Oliver and I, together with our complementary backgrounds, have identified 11 case studies that integrate EBA and CRFI in some way or another. And so we at the group of authors are working with people who lead these initiatives and we have conducted additional interviews with other experts who were then pointing us towards additional examples. So jointly we made a great effort to cover a range of what is possible through these 11 cases. And we are certain that there are even more examples out there uh, than we have described in this study. Even today, we know that new things are already emerging, like, for example, a resilience insurance that TNC and University of California developed together with Munich Re, and also work with risk management solutions on the integration of mangroves in risk models. And all these studies are being published soon. Uh, next slide, please. I want to show you here that um, all in all, we have these 11 case studies, and in a first step, we describe them with much detail by analyzing their elements of success, remaining challenges, and also some gaps that we have identified to move them towards an integrated approach between EBA and CRFI. And while this comparative analysis is inherently subjective because it represents the evaluation of the three authors, we have conducted a wide range of, of interviews to triangulate our own judgment with experts from the insurance industry, risk modeling industry, academia, and also EBA practitioners, which we interviewed as part of this study. Next slide, please. So what we did is we um, complemented this case study description with a criteria-based analysis. We defined a set of 13 criteria, which you can see listed here, that would need to be in place for a fully developed combined EBA and CFRI project. So these criteria are almost like a cycle that indicates a type of maturity or ripeness. Oliver, if you could blend in the arrows, please. Thank you. So, so in this in this maturity cycle, you know, a project would start with risk and benefit assessment, 
moving into product development, market identification, project implementation, and then monitoring as a final step. So our analysis has shown that all these 11 cases are at varying stages of development, which you can see in this blue line in this spider diagram. And you can see here, for example, that uh, all cases had actually identified the climate risk most cases also have concrete ecosystem service functions identified and EBA benefits assessed, and six cases even had an EBA project designed. But in contrast to that, we found that only four out of 11 cases have then also developed a corresponding full CFI product, and only two cases had a concrete EBA project implemented. So all in all, the results of this comparative analysis show that, not surprisingly, implementation is still a limiting factor. But I'd like to point out that this is a very young and emerging field, which is still under development. So it's probably not surprising that we don't have a lot of monitoring experience yet. There are very few bias clearly identified. And it's actually not a simple thing to find a buyer interested in insurance, in EBA, and also a novel product. Uh, almost no cases really had monitored impact, and very few insurance projects clearly show ecosystem benefits. So I will now present to you two concrete examples on the next two slides. They really combine EBA and CFI quite well. Next slide, please. We have the next slide, please. Aha, Oliver? Yeah, that's it, sorry. Uh, can you blend in the next slide, please? I've done that, I think. You yeah, I see, the, I see the community rating system slide, Kirsten. Yeah, Oh, too. okay, I don't see it, but... Um, that's weird. I'm still with the spider bite, but never mind. So I will just continue. So I think, you know, seeing the FEMA, FEMA and um, nature-based solutions case study example. So the FEMA is the U.S. Federal Emergency Management Agency, and uh, they manage the National Flood Insurance Program in the United States, the NFIP, and the overall goal of that program is to reduce impact on flooding impact of flooding on private and public structures. Now, the community rating program is a voluntary program under the NFIP, and it rewards communities for reducing flood risk with discounts on flood insurance premiums. And these discounts are provided for open or green space preservation to reduce flood risk. Um, you can see that on this picture on the left bottom corner and I think I can't see it myself but on the right top corner you, you're seeing a summary table and we have actually presented a summary table like this for each of the 11 case studies which give you like a snapshot analysis of that case and then on the slide you can also see in the bottom right corner the different discount categories that FEMA is granting for different categories of green space preservation. So the NFIP is one of the few and possibly only insurers presently that offers a premium reduction for nature-based solutions. One of the remaining challenges is that the CRS is widely used in more than a thousand communities across the US, but given that over 10,000 communities are actually eligible to participate. This number is still fairly small, and it's just because many communities do not have the capacity to measure and apply the open space premium reduction credits. Next slide, please. So on the next slide, we're showing to you the FEMA cost benefit analysis. And here is an example of an ongoing process in Puerto Rico at the University of California and TNC are engaged with uh, with FEMA and interesting here is that FEMA actually has a cost benefit analysis tool for hazard mitigation measures so under this tool a project is considered cost effective when it has a benefit cost ratio one or greater 
which indicates that the benefit of a prospective hazard mitigation project is sufficient to justify its own cost. And of interest to our study is that FEMA is now actively considering nature-based solutions for this, uh, disaster recovery funding. They have even made policy changes that nature-based solutions only need to have a benefit cost ratio of greater than 0 0.75 so not even one, for flood mitigation, if additional co-benefits, for example, fish production or recreational value, could then achieve a combined benefit cost ratio of one or greater. So we really feel as authors that this policy signals a very important conceptual shift and also acceptance of nature-based solutions while um, a remaining challenge is really the practical implementation of the benefit cost tool because so many of the flood mitigation parameters and models are new to the project proponents. So my last slide is about the Mesoamerican Reef Insurance. This is the first weather risk insurance placed in the market that is based on protecting a marine ecosystem and maintaining its storm surge risk reduction value as an ecosystem service. The business case for this insurance is built on ensuring that the reef reduces flood risk and also stabilizes the beach to protect a tourism industry which is worth $12 billion per year. It also protects several municipalities and their towns along the coastline of Quintana Roo. From a conservation perspective, the reef has a high conservation value. The Mesoamerican Reef is the second longest barrier reef system in the world. The CFRI component of this project has both a finance and also an insurance element. Um, important here is to mention that the government of Quintana Roo formed a coastal zone management trust fund with the participation of hotel associations, other municipalities and also civil society. And the source to finance the premium for the insurance is an existing fee levied from beachfront property owners. And it's designed to make the insurance policy fully self-financing. The insurance product itself is a parametric payout trigger based on wind speed and under the present policy it covers a 3.8 million payout which is supposed to be split 50% for beach renourishment and 50% for reef restoration. Also important to mention here is that the Mesoamerican Reef has already since the year 2008 a monitoring protocol in place which allows to track changes in reef health over time. And in addition to that, TNC has developed restoration protocols for the reef and trained reef brigades who are responsible to repair the reef after damage, to assess the amount of damage and also to develop the response plan. We feel that the strength of this project is that the insurance industry, in this case it was Swiss Re, was highly involved from the very beginning and they contributed their structuring knowledge and also a buyer was part of the design from the very beginning. The project clearly also showed that securing the funding for premium payments is really not a trivial issue. And the intention of this pilot is really for us to demonstrate how to ensure coastal ecosystems provide services for local communities, to quantify them and put a money value in them and to transfer the risk of damages from hurricanes to then provide for reef protection and management. And thank you with that. I'm through my part of the presentation and I hand over to you, Oliver. Uh, thank you, Kerstin. I'm a, a personal fan of the last example that you um, explained because I have personally worked on this one as well and it clearly shows how it can be. So um, hello everyone, um, Oliver from Social Impact Partners and after Mike has explained um, the academic theory and Kerstin has gone through a couple of cases. I'll now present the general findings and afterwards the recommendations that we have figured out in the conduct of this study. So let me start with the findings. 
First of all, he realized that there is a lack of understanding in the insurance industry. Why is that? You have to know that the insurance industry, due to the nature of its business, is rather conservative, um, slow in adaption, and careful with changes. So for years, they have used other risk mitigation mechanisms that they're used to, and EBA is still somewhat new. So EBA solutions are in general not well understood by the industry. The second funding that we had is that funding for such so solutions exists. There is money from several donors available for financing climate change projects and even more so should there be a risk mitigation factor involved. And um, this is something that we really liked. Nevertheless, we have not found any very specific funding for EBA projects specifically. The third um, point, which you might find surprising after what Mike has shown, is that a general quantification is missing. We have seen in Mike's presentation, the first part of this presentation, that it is possible to quantify the benefits of ecosystem-based adaptation, yet still such a quantification is rather tailor-made and time-consuming. To do that quickly and on a broader scale is currently not possible. The fourth finding that we had is that it seems to be a burden for ecosystem-based adaptation measures to get more broadly, broadly accepted that you have to involve so many stakeholders to do that. Not only do you need um, people like me from insurance, um, Mike from um, academia or Kerstin from an NGO, so these three parties might be um, easy to find, but you also need to find a government who is willing to support such a project as well as donors or financially motivated investors. And you constantly have to manage the interests of all parties that are involved here. The last finding that we had is that there is no um, fully implemented pilot project. We do have very positive examples, like the one from Quintana Roo, yet we have not found any projects where the full financing for the ecosystem-based adaptation is completely done via a reduction in premium, for example, and at the same time, a full post-disaster financing, so an insurance mechanism is in place. So these are some of the findings that we had during the study. And now I'd like to go to the recommendations. So what do we need to do if we want to make EBA measures grow? During many interviews that we conducted, when you talked um, to insurance people, what they said you know, it's a nice idea, but it does not work. However, reality is what was shown in the first part of the presentation. It does work. It does pay off to do that. And the this misalignment of the perception of the reality for us leads to a clear recommendation that we have to educate the stakeholders about these benefits. It doesn't make sense to only have those and present them to a limited number of people. We have to do that broadly um, and shake up people so that they really realize that. The second recommendation that we have is, um, again, I'm comparing perception and reality. Perception, what the insurance industry is used to, is that gray infrastructure is always better than green or blue EBA measures. So gray infrastructure would, in this example, be um, on the left-hand side, a flood wall that is permanently installed, 
while the green, uh, or in this case, blue EVA measure would be a coral reef. And why do they say that? Well, first of all, I've said that this has been a, you know, something they've done for years. And secondly, they always um, argue with um, financial benefits. And funnily, when you dig deeper, they, when they think about financial benefits, they only compare the costs of such events. So they compare the costs of the erection and the maintenance of a flood wall um, and the potentially avoided expenses for losses with um, the total costs for a reef. Nevertheless, the reality is that these financial benefits do not only involve costs, but financial benefits are also a variable um, or a function of additional revenue. And I personally, if you look at this um, flood wall on the left again, I could not imagine any uh, way to generate revenue um, with that flood wall that you see here. So that is certainly not a tourist attraction. However, um, if you see the, the coral reef, um, I do see that this could also lead to additional revenue for the people and ultimately for the government. So here clearly one point for um, EBA. Secondly, look at how much biodiversity you see in the upper left picture. I do see one, uh, one being, and that might be the person in the car. Um, if you look at the lower one, the blue coral reef, you do see that the ecosystem-based adaptation measure does also lead to an increase in biodiversity. The third one is that as there are possibilities to generate revenue, such a measure, an EBA measure, can also generate employment. And if we summarize all of this, you do clearly see that the perception from gray infrastructure costing less than green or blue uh, infrastructure or an EBA measure is really just one very small bit of the entire piece. The overall benefits of an EBA measure compared to gray infrastructure are much broader. And we have to tell people that these EBA measures are looked at from a very holistic perspective and that all three aspects that you see on the right are being evaluated. Um, what are the key recommendations um, or other recommendations that we have if we want to make EBA grow? First of all, as I've already said, quantification is needed. Um, I worked as an underwriter for um, 10 years and when you look at a risk, you always look at how well a risk or a certain, let's say, a hotel is protected. Therefore, you have people, so-called risk surveyors, walking through the hotel and they would say, um, how, where is your flood wall, how do you maintain your sprinklers and so on. Nevertheless, and then they, sorry, and then they produce reports about this that are then evaluated by the underwriters like myself. I've never seen any report in which any EBA measure was even mentioned and should that be the case. Should these surveyors evaluate those as well, then insurers will ask the owners of hotels, what about the coral reef? Um, have you maintained it? And should that be the case, then um, clearly there's more pressure on the owners of the assets of the hotel to maintain them. Secondly, the entire industry is basically using standard um, tools to model the expected loss. And here you would always have, you know, some variables in which you could tick whether a flood wall is in place or the sprinklers are well maintained. Nevertheless, these standard models do not have any possibility to somehow evaluate if an EBA measure is in place. So that would be a, a wish from our side to these modeling agencies that they implement these possibilities as well. Thirdly, if you want to have an EBA measure in place, we don't need to talk about very big insurance schemes. We can also talk about um, others like social impact bonds, where you do need the insurance industry to evaluate the risk, but not necessarily provide a risk transfer solutions. 
but these might be on a smaller scale a very good solution to um, enforce EBA measures and they have partly already been implemented. The next one that is my personal um, favorite and my the most important one for me if we want to establish further EBA projects I have mentioned that they've got three main advantages the social aspects the biodiversity aspects and the financial aspects the bigger the financial interest of an industry or those people that are protected by an EBA measure, the bigger that financial interest is, the more likely is it going to be that this will be accepted. So if we want to implement further EBA measures, let's try to focus on areas where there's also a financial interest of the people protected by the EBA measures, such as the tourism industry. The third one, uh, the, sorry, the fifth one is that um, we should, with these EBA measures, also try to cover high frequency events and not low frequency events. Why is that the case? You need the support of governments, of politicians, to um, implement an EBA measure. You, need, you might need uh, money for that and you need the support of politics. If the actual uh, governor who is you know, re-elected every four years um, does build something like that and the actual benefits are not visible um, to the people because the, you know, the, the flood um, does only recur every 100 years, it's less likely to, um, to be a good benefit um, for him or less likely is he going to support it. So um, we would tell people to rather focus on high frequency events so that they quickly see the returns of the EBA measure. The last recommendation is if you look for an insurance partner, look for a very innovative one. Insurers or insurance consultancies do have to go the extra mile to do that. It would always be the easier way to say, no, we don't understand it, and this is why we don't want to do it. You do need people that are willing to uh, invest some time in it, that are also interested in maybe the social benefits and the biodiversity aspects. And only if you have the right partners in place that think alike, then you will get support. Um, and here, I mean, we've seen some examples. I personally work for Social Impact Partners. We'd also be willing to support you in that respect. And this is basically um, it from my side. And here with I am concluding that um, I'll hand over to um, Daniel in a second. Um, it's already mentioned that the report has been published. Should you have any questions after the session, um, then you, of course, always uh, welcome to contact us and the email addresses can be seen here. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Oliver. Um, and Mike and uh, Kerstin for, for this um, um, very comprehensive overview of, of the study and the findings. So um, so the question now is where do we go from here uh, with this and how do we build on um, the, um, the, the research that, that you've done and the recommendations that you have put forward? Um, I mean, clearly, for, from from uh, from the partnership, from the interresilience global partnerships perspective, uh, the question is: Is there an application in the development in a development context? Is there an application to strengthen the resilience of poor and vulnerable people? Um, we saw some of the uh, limitations, some of the barriers, uh, like, for example, the missing quantification. Um, and this particularly applies to regions where um, models, risk models are not yet available and uh, needless to say are not available with full integration of EBA measures and with the full integration of um, the 
resilience or the risk reduction effects of nature-based um, uh, solutions. So um, what we um, want to do next year within the Integrated Approaches Working Group is we want to explore this uh, question further. How can it be applied in the developmental context? And um, we see great potential, and I think the study shows that there is uh, potential um, to use risk finance and insurance to incentivize investments in nature and investments in resilience building nature and vice versa to use um, nature and ecosystem-based adaptation measures to incentivize or to improve um, uh, um, risk finance and insurance products. Um, so with the um, year 2020 also being the year of biodiversity, um, um, the partnership wants to put forward an action plan on nature-based solutions, um, um, an action plan that combines insurance with nature-based solutions. Um, and we see um, on an implementation level, and um, this action plan is yet to be developed, but there are, um, I think, three solution areas that we see as most uh, promising and that we should explore further. Um, the first one is um, insurance of ecosystem-based adaptation itself. We saw the Mesoamerican Reef example where an insurance uh, product has been um, tailored for a coral reef and the payouts are used to restore a coral reef and this, to restore the resilience benefits of a coral reef. Um, so how can we, how can we apply this uh, to other regions and how can we apply this for in the context of vulnerable communities? Um, that's number one. Number two is um, the combination of insurance and an ecosystem-based adaptation measure um, to really capture the, the shared benefits. Um, Kasten briefly mentioned a project with Munich Re, um, and I think there's great potential in, 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 in leveraging this, in exploring how this solution can be uh, embedded in existing insurance schemes. So, for example, a coral reef restoration leads to risk reduction uh, effects, and those risk reduction benefits are um, paid out in a way through reductions in premium um, correspondingly over a multi-year period in which the coral reef uh, restoration project is taking place. So this is this is an example and the idea of combining nature-based um, solutions um, to cross-finance um, um, or, or to, to, to use premium reductions to cross-finance initial investments in nature is, is, um, is one that has been very much explored already by Kerstin or by TNC and Munich Re, and we want to build on that as well. Um, the final um, area of solution is, as, as uh, Oli already pointed out, uh, impact financing mechanisms. So, Impact financing mechanisms ha have been used in, in various um, social contexts. Um, the idea is really to, to provide um, um, the ultimate beneficiaries or governments with a very fixed, very secure outcome of their investment by having investors, private money, um, come in first to to provide the initial financing and only if the project is su successful, um, the, um, the government or the subnational government comes in and reimburses the investors. If it isn't successful, investors lose their money, um, the, the, um, uh, the public, uh, the, the, the government doesn't need to pay. Um, so th the idea, um, can be applied to resilience, it can be applied to gray infrastructure, but it can also be applied to, uh, to, uh, to green infrastructure. And uh, there is already a feasibility study in Indonesia ongoing within the partnership, within this working group uh, on this, and it's something that we very much want to build on. Um, so definitely the action plan will engage the implementation resources under the partnership um, to really bring it down uh, to a um, to to an action uh, level in 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 our partner countries. Um, 
yes, I think with that, I'll hand over to Andrea, who will uh, moderate uh, the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks a lot again to Mike, Oliver and Kerstin for this very insightful input and presentation. So we do have some questions already. There's one, for example, from Christian working for the Munich Re Foundation. When using ecosystems for adaptation, we speak about very long time frames. So restoring mangroves or reefs might take centuries. How can we increase the speed of EBA? Are there information in your research about time frames as well? I would guess that this question is mainly addressed to you, Mike, but please, um, all the others, feel free to address these as well. Yeah, well, just uh, just very quickly, uh, one, it's a, it's a good question uh, and very important uh, from a financing uh, point of view, uh, uh, but ecosystem restoration actually can be very quick. Uh, if you have flood risk reduction benefits in mind, um, uh, then it's possible, for example, with reef restoration uh, to team uh, uh, structural restoration using, for example, reef blocks to quickly get back uh, the height uh, of the reef, which is the main adaptation benefit vis-a-vis -vis flooding, um, uh, and then grow corals on top of those reef blocks. This is, uh, you know, uh, something that is actually done widely out there and um, that can deliver uh, immediate benefits of the, the sort uh, required by FEMA and this is uh, explained uh, a good deal uh, in a paper just out uh, that Daniel was alluding to uh, about uh, resilience insurance. Mangroves are also, I mean, just as a point, mangroves are a weed. Um, uh, they grow very quickly in an environment uh, where few other things compete with them. So uh, even if you were going from seedlings, uh, you know, uh, the time uh, to get back mangroves could be mm, uh, uh, four years, uh, but you can actually do some other approaches to deliver quick flood reduction benefits, for example, planting larger trees in the front line right away, uh, you know, that you've grown in nurseries, uh, or even using some things like uh, willow fencing uh, in the front of a mangrove restoration project to help provide uh, quick erosion reduction benefits. Um, uh, so that was a long way of saying uh, it is actually possible to deliver benefits quickly. Thank you. Another question maybe to you, Kirsten. Um, what revenues are gained, what investors will receive, and what are the incentives of the investors to get on board? Maybe this to start first. There are two more questions within mm -hmm. that comment. <laughs> Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, both of these examples that I have presented are not based on the capital market, so we're not really working with private investors. Um, that's an example that Dave uh, Daniel um, just alluded to in his model number three, the social impact bonds, but to my knowledge, this doesn't exist yet in combination with an EBA measure. This is also under development. So um, maybe Daniel, you you want to add here on the revenue question? Yeah, I think I mean I think obviously bankability is is a is a key question. I mean um, there are um, this is obviously um, something for a more let's say sophisticated investor base, a sustainable investor base. So uh, green. Uh, funds, for example, um, looking to to also um, create a, a let's say a double bottom line. So beyond returns, also having um, um, sustainability benefits um, and 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 other um, aspects uh, covered. Um, I think there is still a long way to go in terms of education of these investors. Um, one, let's say, key uh, success factor is if we set up an impact financing mechanism where, for example, we would say um, we invest in the restoration of mangroves and if that restoration of mangroves is successful, investors get their money back and the municipality or the local government would then pay um, for that restoration, then obviously we need a very reliable um, and very uh, impartial um, uh, 
measurement indicator of whether that um, mangrove restoration project was successful in terms of bringing resilience benefits. And I think that's the that's the uh, crucial point. So can we come up with um, with uh, indexes with um, measurement systems that say yes, a project uh, where um, um, uh, in, an EBA project was successful in delivering resilience benefits um, to the community, and um, and this can be reliably assessed after uh, let's say three or four years of implementation, um, because obviously investors will need to uh, trust this measurement indicator to invest their money into these kind of impact based uh, mechanisms so um, i think i think once again quantification and having a clear idea of 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 benefits and how to measure them is 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 of essence and let me add something here quickly. Um, so if you want to look for a very practical example, um, you can Google the DC Water Environmental Impact Bond um, investor, among others. Um, Daniel just mentioned that they have to be professional, is Goldman Sachs. So you can see on the one hand that they know a lot about finance, on the other hand that there certainly is some type of financial interest in that. And um, this is a impact bond that uses green infrastructure to manage the stormwater runoff and to improve the um, district's water quality and clearly mark payouts depending on the improved um, uh, um, water um, stormwater runoff and um, so the more water runs off and um, the more payout the private investor in this case um, Goldman Sachs gets um, please Google DC Water Environmental Impact Bond, and that'll answer many of your questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah, if I can come back in here, I mean, we we um we did explore the investors' question also when we looked at the resilience bond with Munich Re, and and clearly here you need a certain volume, financial volume, to go to the capital market, probably somewhere around 30 million or so, and I think. We also need to be careful that we don't overpromise where we are. I indicated this is a very young and emerging field, and we are right now just to, about to begin with some early pilots. You know, there are concepts out there, there are some early pilots, but I don't think in this community we are really at a stage yet where we have sufficient enough volume over these pilots. and test cases that we can really securely take them to the capital market and I want to say I, I, I didn't we didn't select the um, DC stormwater bond as a case study for here for this report on purpose because it did not deliver so well on the EBA side in terms of you know um, really the green outcomes that were supposed to be achieved. I think they really leveraged a lot of capital for the municipality, but on the EBA side, the Washington DC stormwater one did not deliver so well. So I just want to also here express a word of caution, you know, that we look at this topic all together with care and really assess at every step what really the results are and, and how solid they are and and you know how how big we can get with this because each ecosystem is is very specific and delivers with different time frames and on a different scale thank you yeah so maybe we move on to the next question there's a question from sandrine working for eclay mainly um together with local governments so how do you think we should communicate decision makers about such strategies um like nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based adaptation what is the best kind of data to present to them and do you have any previous experience that could give us some sort of insight about that i think oliver you presented a bit on that on financial social and ecological benefits maybe you would like to start? Uh, it's such a good question that I'm <laughs> that I'm not happy to start here. But um, I mean, the big question really is where to reach um, those uh, leaders. You, as I said, the big uh, thing 
is reaching the government and probably where you reach them best is by really publishing it also among the people that um, vote. Um, and then that could put pressure on the governments. What we have seen in the past is that any ecosystem-based adaptation measure was mainly promoted by green parties, right? By parties that would um, only emphasize on the biodiversity aspect. What we would personally like to see, having shown that EBA can generate jobs and can um, generate revenues while reducing costs is that this is not only a topic that is taken up by the green parties, but also by other rather uh, other parties that do not mainly focus on this green um, aspect. So the, the benefits are that big that looking at it from a biodiversity aspect is uh, really poor. And uh, I do believe that the best thing is to really go out and tell everyone how to do that. I'm not sure. Um, so. I, I'm sorry. I, I would just uh, add in here just a, a, a kind of a qu couple of quick things. I mean, the, the uh, uh, decision makers that we've worked with at a whole variety of levels uh, are particularly interested in the uh, potential uh, cost effectiveness uh, of these sorts of strategies. Um, uh, and then, as Oliver noted, uh, second is uh, jobs. And you have to think about where you're going to create uh, jobs and opportunities for uh, the engineering firms uh, that would have otherwise built gray infrastructure. Um, uh, so uh, you uh, shouldn't try to just compete against them. Uh, we should find opportunities uh, for collaboration, uh, particularly around uh, those kinds of jobs. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, you know, uh, the thing that still needs to grow uh, is more uh, demonstrations, because uh, after we uh, point to the clear evidence, uh, even when we do that with insurance, uh, you know, uh, there still is the ongoing question of uh, show me it in action, uh, and uh, that still is probably uh, uh, the greatest weak spot. And Mike, there's a colleague of yours um, also working at the Coastal Science and Policy Program at UC um, Santa Cruz. Um, he noticed um, that the spider web analysis um, you just showed in the slides, um, that very few of these examples appear to have a monitoring protocol in place and being implemented. Is this a major gap in the development of insurance options in general or especially um, for small island states? Well, Kirsten covered that uh, uh, pretty well. I'll just only add uh, that, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, there isn't a long-term monitoring uh, yet in place because there are uh, very few uh, of these demos and they're uh, mostly all very young. Uh, and this is a wider problem uh, with measuring the benefits uh, of habitat restoration in general. Most habitat restoration funders want to fund for two years. Um, uh, you know, uh, I want to fund you to get the project uh, in the ground, uh, you know, uh, up and running, uh, and then there's no more funding, so uh, we could talk about monitoring all we want. Now, the more that these are put in place as infrastructure, natural infrastructure type projects that must deliver benefits uh, for uh, adaptation, flood risk reduction, then you create greater opportunity to measure over time. Maybe just to add here um, on what Mike explained, what, so why we may have some monitoring programs in place that man, uh, monitor the effects of ecosystems over time and, and their quality and conditions. These monitoring programs may then not necessarily measure the risk reduction characteristics of those ecosystems, which are actually slightly different features. Because even in the ABA community, I mean, let's be honest, you know, looking at ecosystems for risk reduction is also a new topic. Yeah, and then combining them with insurance yet complicates it a little more. But so while we do a lot of ecological um, monitoring in the conservation community, we don't usually monitor these ecosystems for their risk reduction benefits. Thanks.
Thank you. Um, there's another question from Astrid, uh, who else apart from communities and tourism could be interested to invest? And what happens if ecosystem gets destroyed? So it's about tipping points. Maybe that's also the first question to you, Kirsten, and the second one to you, Mike. Yeah, the tipping point question, I think, is best place to Mike. Um, tourism industry, I think, has really great potential. And the Mesoamerican Reef example is already a concrete example where the tourism industry and industry association in Quintana Roo is actually a partner in the trust fund. Um, so they are part of financing this integrated solution. And um, through our work with partners on the ground, we also realize that there is actually interest emerging and growing among the tourism industry for this subject. Um, let me quickly add on that, sorry, picking up on this. Um, for coastal, um, there's also uh, fisheries, for example, um, that might be interested, you know, in just basically getting more fish. But if we get away from coastal, um, the entire agricultural industry um, can also be interested in that. So, the, I mean, it just depends on your creativity. There are tons of opportunities out there. Mike? Yeah. And, and sorry, this is uh, uh, Mike, uh, Andre. Uh, what regards was the tipping point uh, question uh, directed at? Sorry if I missed, I can't see it in the comments. Um, Astrid asked, what happens if the ecosystem gets destroyed? I guess um, it's meant in a way that it's already ah, an ecosystem okay. that is insured. Uh, yeah. Yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. My. Uh, so uh, that's accounted for uh, in uh, the f what's called fragility curves, um, uh, which is something that is just starting to be uh, developed for, for ecosystems. And it is something uh, that will be, for example, uh, a part of uh, the work with uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency because their benefit cost analysis, BCA, uh, does in fact uh, uh, require uh, some estimate of the fragility that is for example under what conditions storm conditions will the habitat fail um, uh, and again uh, there are some of these curves uh, starting to get out there uh, very interesting thank you very much and um, if there are no further questions well uh, I would like to conclude this session now then and if you have further feedback questions please use the chat box afterwards or contact me via andrea.bender at giz.de and the recordings of this webinar will be online soon on adaptation community net and you can find the presented study also online on adaptation community net we will share the link as well and uh, yeah, thank you very much. We will keep you updated regarding future webinars and um, have a pleasant rest of the day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.